Hi guys, welcome to another Learn Electronics Repair video. This video is sponsored by PCBWay and today we're going to look at making a very interesting piece of test equipment, hopefully quite cheaply. I'll show you the project on PCBWay's website first and show you where you can order your PCBs and they have a really fast service producing PCBs so you can upload your Gerber files usually within 24 hours they are produced and they will ship them out to you on an express delivery if you're happy to pay the price for that express or they'll put it onto standard delivery for you so let's go over to pcbway's website this is pcbway.com and i've been looking through a lot of the projects that they have on here so these are projects that people upload themselves and you can do too you can upload your design on here and you will get a 10% commission on any PCBs that people order from your design. So we have this little tester, and this is a flyback tester. So this is intended to test transformers, either switch mode power supply transformers or linear power supply transformers. And I'll show you what this actually does and why we need this sort of tester. This project is from this guy, Farid Reid, an Indonesian guy. He has a YouTube channel. However, of course, the video is all in Indonesian. The only problem, if you like, with this video is the fact that the PDF file with the schematic seems to be missing. I've looked around for the PDF. I can't find it. You'll see this version here is not actually the same as the PCB on PCBWay, but he did upload it. Fortunately, he marked all the component values on the PCB itself. But there's a bit of information missing, so this could be an interesting little project. We might have to do some work ourselves to get it working. We can have a quick look at the video, so this is his video. Yeah. And you can see this is the project. There is a link here for the circuit diagrams and schematics. I've tried to use this link, however, I can't actually find the files. In fact, you don't need to copy paste it, you can just click on this here. It takes you to the same link. It's all Indonesian, maybe it's just me not being able to actually find what I'm looking for here. But I've seen some other comments, people saying that the PDF is missing. So let's see if we can figure it out ourselves and get this to work. This is the PCB I ordered from PCBWay. They came in a pack of five. And you can see this is an unpopulated one that all the markings for the components are actually on the PCB. That's how I managed to put this together because I don't have the schematic. But what we can try to do is we can try to actually create a schematic from the PCB. It's double-sided, but it's fairly simple. So a little bit later, let's see if we can actually create a schematic for this. And we may have to do that anyway if it doesn't actually work properly. Another thing I noted is that on the one on his YouTube video, it clearly has an LM358 IC here, which is a dual op amp. But the PCB is marked as LM393. I had a look at the data sheets and also did a quick Google around. And it basically says that they are compatible devices, but the LM393 can drive a load that draws more current and also withstand more voltage on the output as well. I think it's up to 50 volts, whereas the 393 isn't. So it may be that we need to use an LM393. And because I didn't notice this earlier, I was looking at the video. I don't actually have any in stock, at least not any of the through hole ones. I do have surface mount ones. There's one on here. So I've actually sold it to a little adapter. It's one that I use with my EEPROM programmer. But for now, we can just use it for this. And I could actually insert this adapter into the actual IC holder. I have to bend these out slightly to do it, but it's not a problem. 
We can, however, fit an LM358 initially, which he does show on his at least original version. And let's see if that works. And if not, we can try this one. So I'll put the LM358 in there. Another thing I note with this, not having a schematic, is not knowing what the supply voltage is. So I had a look at the data sheet for the 4015, which is a shift register chip, and for the 393. Now the 393 can handle up to 36 volts, and this can handle up to 18 volts. So I suspect this probably has a 12 volt supply. The capacitor wasn't marked with a voltage on the silk screen. I put a 25 volt in there. But I don't see anything else here that would really limit the voltage. We have this transistor, LM328. This may well be driving the coil under test. So we could have a quick look as well at that just to see what the highest voltage rating is. That would be voltage collector emitter, I would think. So we can have a quick look at that as well. If we can not see any other particular limitations, we'll use 12 volt supply. This is the data sheet for the BC328. It's a PNP transistor, and we can see it can handle up to 25 volts DC collector emitter. So that gives us a good idea. I'm still pretty confident that 12 volts is a decent enough supply voltage to try to use on this circuit board. Before we test this, let me explain to you what a flyback tester, or as it's known as a ring tester, actually does. We use a flyback tester, or also known as a ring tester, to find a particular type of fault in an inductor or a transformer. And we can't easily really find this sort of fault in any other way. So what we're using it for is to find shorted turns in transformers and inductors. I'll just explain what a shorted turn is and why it matters so much. So if we imagine we have a transformer, it'll have a primary winding. and a secondary or secondaries winding windings. It can have more than one. It can also, for example, have a center tapped winding. So you could imagine something like this. With a center tap. Okay, and this might be on a mains transformer, 240 volts in. And this will be your output. So this could be like 0 volts. And we would have, for example, two 12 volt supplies. And we can use rectifiers to get a plus or minus 12 volt supply out of this, for example. We also have transformers using switch mode power supplies. And they're basically the same, but with a switch mode power supply, you would have one primary connecting to usually a MOSFET, sometimes a bipolar transistor. And they normally have a better symbol than that. I'm not very good at drawing these quickly, okay. Ground, sorry, hot ground. Yeah. This sort of circuit. And on the transformer, you will have several secondaries. Maybe three or more. Depends on the power supply, how many voltages you require. And often with a switch mode power supply, not just external voltages, but there'll be internal voltages, internal voltages that, for example, power the pulse with modulator controller and such like. So the way the transformer actually works is you have a magnetic field in the primary, either from AC mains uh, 50 hertz, 60 hertz, or in this case for a pulse with modulator switching the MOSFET on very fastly, on off, on off, on off, and this would have maybe into the hundreds of kilohertz frequency. 
But in both cases, we have an AC signal in the primary, either low frequency or high frequency. And the AC signal effectively causes the primary to magnetize first in one direction. And then when it switches the polarity, the magnetic field collapses and magnetizes the other way. And then collapses and magnetizes the other way. So effectively, this coil is like a magnet, just alternately magnetizing in each direction. And this is doing the same thing, it's just very, very fast. The magnetic field that's being built up and collapsing, built up and collapsing, as it collapses, that magnetic field doesn't only pass through the winding in the primary, it passes through the winding in the secondary or secondaries as well. And that's how it actually induces a voltage into the output. So there's no connection between the primary and secondary, physically or electrically. It's the magnetic field that basically, as the field collapses and if you like cuts through the winding, the coils, it induces a voltage into the secondary. And basically, the number of turns in the primary to secondary will set the output voltage. So, if this had 240 volts AC on the primary, and the secondary had 10 times less the number of turns of wire, you would get 10 times less the voltage. So, you'd have 240 volts in, and you'd have 24 volts out. Okay? So, this is how a transformer works. transformer now you might think well if you've got 240 volts going in and there's only 24 volts coming out where have all the other volts gone to because you can't like destroy energy or create energy how can you have 240 volts here but there's only 24 volt there where's the rest of them yeah and basically you're not actually creating or destroying energy and the same applies, you can have a transformer the other way, by the way. You can have 24 volts AC on the primary, and with many more turnings, you can have 240 volts AC coming out. Where are the other volts coming from? How are you making volts? It's the same question. Well, the fact is, you're not really creating or destroying energy. What happens is that if you have depending on the resistance of this winding, 240 volts, one amp flowing through here, which effectively is 240 watts, you will be able to get 24 volts at 10 amps coming out. So the input, if you like, is volts times amp, yeah, 240 times one equals 240, and on the output is volts times amp, but you can now get up to 10 amps, 24, 24 times 10 compared with 240 times 1. Yeah. So that's how you transform it without going to the maths of it. That's how it basically works. So the wattage going in, 240, 240 times 1, is exactly the same as the wattage coming out, 24 times 10. Okay? Very quick lesson on transformers. And that's all you really need to know. So what can go wrong with a transformer? Well... The winding, either the primary or secondary, or one of the secondaries, can go open circuit. So you can get a break in the winding, or even burnt, but it's broken, yeah? If you get a break in the winding, you'll be able to find that with a multimeter. So using a multimeter, you can measure the resistance. And on a transformer primary, a mains one, it might be a few hundred ohms. On the secondary, because there's usually a lot less windings, it's dropping the voltage down. And it's also thicker wire, because you have more current in the secondary than the primary. It will normally be very low resistance, maybe just a few ohms. So an open circuit winding is very easy to find, because it reads open circuit. And you can find that using your multimeter, easily. But there's another way the transformer can go faulty, and this is much more difficult to find. Your wire inside the transformer is basically enameled wire, so it's wired with like an enameled 
coating on it, which is the insulator, and it's wound very closely. I can show you one. This is the best way. Here is a bobbin off a transformer. I strip these down for the enameled wire sometimes. Let's zoom down on a little bit. And here it is. So you can see the wire is actually quite thin, and it could be a lot thinner than this. And if you look on the bobbin, you'll see that the wire is actually wound very closely together. If I strip a bit of this off, you'll see that each turn effectively is touching the next one. But because this has an enamel coating on, this doesn't conduct. If I take my ohm meter, you'll see. Although it looks like copper wire, it isn't. Yeah. So we have a short. If I actually put my meter across this wire, look, it doesn't conduct, yeah? It has an insulated coating, okay? So, one of two things can happen. If you have, for example, a short circuit on the output, and there's nothing like a fuse, for example, to limit the amount of current, the secondary will start to draw a lot of power into the short circuit. And because we have this situation where the energy in equals the energy out, if you have a short circuit on the output, it will cause a lot of current to flow in the primary because it tries to balance this equation. Now, normally, the primary is much thinner wire with a lot more turns than the secondary. And because it's thinner wire, it gets hotter. Yeah, it has more resistance, it gets hotter. So it's quite possible for the transformer to burn out. And it's normally the primary that does it. It doesn't have to be, but it's normally the primary that burns, yeah, when it goes wrong. And you can usually see it. You can actually see the outside of the transformer is like charcoal or blackened. You can see that you have a burnt out transformer. And if you measure the resistance of the primary, it might be open circuit, it might have burnt and gone open circuit, or it might have effectively all become like a mass of metal, yeah, and not exactly melted, but all the insulation's gone, it means like a short. So that sort of fault again is very easy to find normally. But there's a third type of fault, and this is much harder to find. This type of fault involves shorted turns. So what you have is a short circuit between one turn and the next one. And there may be only one short circuit between two turns and the whole transformer. And you might wonder, well, why does that matter? Because, for example, in this step-down transformer, we'll draw another one, yeah, just one winding each. In this transformer, you might have a thousand turns here, or two thousand turns of wire, yeah? And on the output, you may have 200 turns of wire. So the ratio is 10 to 1. It drops the voltage down by a factor of 10. What does it matter if two of these turns touch each other? Because if that happens, yeah, those two have touched each other. You've now got 199 turns, yeah, because that was just shorted, that one. But you've still got 199 turns, and the difference in the ratio is practically nothing, so you'll still basically have a, a 10 to 1. The amount of voltage difference is, is negligible, yeah? But that isn't the problem. The problem is that that shorted turn becomes another secondary, and it's short circuit. So you've now got two secondaries. You've got one with 199 turns in, and one with one turn in. This winding, which is now short, will try to draw a massive current. So where you had, for example, like one amp, uh, one amp in here, and up to 10 amps in here, for example, this is like not a hundredth, it's like a, a two hundredth of that. So this will try to draw like a thousand of amps, yeah, 2,000 amps. It would try to, if the wire was thick enough, and this could supply enough power to do it. But of course it can't. So, in some cases, this will just cause the primary to burn out. But in other cases, it won't. 
it'll, it'll blow the fuse, obviously, if there's a fuse here. But you can have a shorted turn, and this happens in these type of circuits, where you get one shorted turn on one of the windings, you know, like that, which becomes another secondary, and it can blow the MOSFET. The power supply can run, but like the MOSFET's working very hard, possibly getting hot, but there's practically no voltage coming out of it. Uh, the pulse width modulator's on maximum duty cycle, it's working hard, but there's no voltage, or it just doesn't have any warmth anymore, yeah? So this sort of fault is very difficult to find, and it's practically impossible with a multimeter. You can find it with a milli-ohm meter, but really only if you have another transformer of the same type to compare with. Yeah, because the difference will be very small. And I actually came across this recently. So I have one here, which does have shorted turns. We can have a quick look on the multimeter and on the milliohm meter. And then let's have a look with our ring tester and see what that shows. These are two amplifier modules. You may have seen the video on these. I published a couple of weeks ago. If you did, by the way, you're wondering what's happening to these. One of them is repaired, working. One of them has a faulty transformer with shorty turns. And the guy hasn't collected them yet, but he says he has a friend who has a business who can rewind the transformer. So in this case, he can actually repair the faulty transformer. I'm just waiting for him to collect them. But we can have a quick look how they read. So this is the good one. And if we measure across the... I'll switch it on, of course. If we measure across the mains, this is reading. Let's get a steady reading on it. 13.7, 13 13.6 13 ohms. That's a good one. This is a bad one. And this reads on the mains again. Less. Okay, he reads about 6.5 ohms, 6.4. But if you didn't have one to compare with, that's a perfectly good reading for a transformer. We only know it's wrong because we have a good one. I've disconnected the secondaries. This has two secondaries. So we have a center tapped one and we have just a single winding. But we can measure just across both windings. So this is the good one again. And this will read lower, yeah. So this is reading 2.1 ohms, okay? And we don't need to bother with the center tap. We can measure directly across the winding. And this is reading 1.4, okay? So 1.4, 2.1. Let's look at the bad one. Well, this is 1.4 on the good one. 0.6.5 yeah and on the other winding this was reading 2.1 and it's reading 1.3 1.2 so this is a faulty transformer it's disconnected from the amplifier and this blows the fuse as soon as you plug it in even when it's not connected to anything so we know that's a bad transformer but if we didn't have the luxury of having a good one to compare with we wouldn't be able to find the fault yeah, you probably would find it if you figured out that by unplugging the transformer, it still blows the fuse. And then realising there's no short on the input, so that's not what's blowing the fuse, it's the transformer. Let's have a look then to our ring tester. Well, I have built it, let's see if it works, and then we'll come back and test these. First of all, we will try this with an LM358. Let's see... If it works, you've probably noticed by the way this I've actually mounted the LEDs backwards, if you like, so they're on this side. The only reason for that is because this has four mounting holes, and I could fit this into a little enclosure with the LEDs just peeking through from this side. Yeah, it's easier to mount, that's the reason why I've done that. These LEDs, the first three are green, yellow, and red, and I understand that if we have green lit up 
It's a good transformer. Yellow is questionable and red is a bad one. Let's see. So the first thing we'll do is connect a 12 volt supply here from our bench supply. You can see my bench power supply then. I have it set to 12 volts. So let's connect that to our circuit and let's see if it draws any power and if it does anything. Okay. What's it actually do? Well, it draws a little bit of power, so it's doing something. Oh, and we have one of the LEDs lit up, a red LED. So let's connect this to our transformer and see if it works. Okay. So we'll connect the output. This says uh, ground and hot on it. So we'll connect hot to one of our secondaries. Okay. And we'll connect the other one, the ground, to the other end of the secondary. So this is the gourd transformer. Okay. We have our tester. Let's see what that actually does. Well, I have to connect the power to it. That's what it actually does. Okay, let's see. Oh. So we still just get one. one red LED lit up. Was it, was it flicking the other ones? I just make it actually see it slightly. Yeah, the ones are flicking. Okay. Let's just make sure we actually have a connection on all these crocodile clip leads. So, I've just, I've disconnected the power. Let's uh, measure across here so we should see here the actual resistance of the secondary yeah it's reading very low so I'm sure that's what we've seen if we disconnect that yeah, much higher let's try the other winding it was obviously connected Okay. Let's see if we have a reading now. Yeah, so I'm definitely connecting to the winding. What's it do on this winding? Once again, I'll apply some power. And two light up. So something different's happening. I think what we need to do first with this to figure out what this is actually doing is to work out what the schematic is. So there's no schematic available from what I can see on the PDF. So let's have a look to see how we would create a schematic from just a PCB layout, a double-sided one. Before we figure out how this actually works, which means we're going to reverse engineer this PCB because we don't actually have the schematic file. And I guess I could ask the guy, but hey, this is going to be fun, yeah? So before we do that, I think it's probably a good idea if I explain how a ring tester actually works, what it's doing, and it'll help us to reverse engineer this, I'm sure. A ring tester works on the basis that an inductor will effectively oscillate if you put a pulse of current through it and then suddenly stop the current. So we have the winding of the transformer or the inductor that we want to test. And this will go to some sort of switch. Now our PCB has a transistor on it and two ICs. We see LM. 393 or 358 we're using we have 4015 and we have a transistor bc328 which is a pnp transistor and i'm pretty sure that the transistor however it's wired is going to be sending the current into the winding it's quite possible that this end is ground but this is a guess i haven't looked yet and we have something like this from a positive supply. 
So we can switch this transistor on to pass some current and then switch it off. And when it switches off, the magnetic field collapses. Well, basically, this is like an open circuit. We've disconnected it. So what the inductor will do, as the field collapses, it will generate voltage at the other end. So initially, when the transistor's on, this is the positive end. Okay? The current flows in, magnetizes the coil, and this is the negative end. When we switch it off, the current will try to flow in the same direction as the field collapses. So this end will become positive and this end will become negative. And the field will collapse and then tend to magnetize it in the opposite direction. And then it sort of swings back again. And this time it doesn't charge as much. So effectively, the coil, when we switch it off, will do something like this. Uh, just like if you imagine like a, a ball on a piece of elastic, we pull it down and we let go and it bounces up and down and gradually the oscillations become less and less. And this is what it means by ringing. Okay. Now a good coil with no shorted turns or no short circuit load on the output if it's a transformer will ring several times before eventually it comes down to zero. A coil that has a lot of a load, whether it's a shorted turn or whether it's a short on a secondary, we kind of like it be like a dud. So it'll magnetize up, and when you let it go, it'll only just go a little bit. Yeah, it'll do something like that. It'll probably just give up. Yeah. And obviously, it'll give up at the same level where it started, which was there. Okay. So a bad coil won't ring, or it might just do one. It won't continue to oscillate and this is ringing if you think it's like when you hit a bell so you hit a bell with a hammer it goes bong yeah and that's the ringing effect and the dud one won't it'll just go clank yeah so electrically it's the same principle as that so our circuit i think we can figure out probably what it's doing before we start to reverse engineer it the transistor is almost certainly what is sending the pulse of current through the coil lm393 is a comparator it has two comparators and it's each comparator effectively compares two incoming voltages plus and minus but they're actually inverted and non-inverted it's a type of operational amplifier and if this input is more than this input the output will be high basically supply voltage 12 volts and if this input is higher than this one, it will be zero. So this will effectively, I would imagine, we have to figure it out, be mon monitoring this ringing and effectively counting how many of these are. Because coming out of it will be like this, yeah. Even though this is getting smaller in amplitude, this will give you a constant amplitude for every time this crosses zero, basically. So I'm sure that's what the op amp is doing. There are two in there. Whether one is doing this and the other one is somehow forming an oscillator to make this pulse, I'm not quite sure. We'll have to work it out. The other IC, this one, and we can look at the data sheets for these, but this is a shift register. So what a shift register basically does, or one of the things it can do because there's different types. I think you'll find this shift register We'll have, how many LEDs do we have? Eight LEDs. So I think you'll have eight outputs. Yeah. And each output will go to an LED. One way or the other. Whether it's providing power or connecting ground. Okay. Each output will go. One, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. And coming into here will be serial data, yeah. And I'm pretty sure what it will do is, effectively, it, it'll have serial data, it'll have a clock as well. And the idea is that on the data, you can put a one or a zero, and then you pulse the clock and the data shifts into the register. Shift register, yeah. So imagine the data is a one, logic one, 
Yeah, high voltage. And you put a clock. So the logic one goes into this first output and this goes high. Okay? Imagine this is a one again. And you clock it again. The first one will shift to there. And the second one will go in here. So now both of these are on. If we then send a zero on the data, naught volts, and we clock it again, the zero will go into here and the two will shift along. Yeah. So what you'll actually have is, this will now be zero, so the LED will be off, and these two will be one, so it's on. And we can keep shifting data in until we fill the register. What I think our system is almost certainly going to be doing is prob <laughs> certainly probably, yeah, I think we'll find that the data line is always high. 12 volts maybe, whatever we have on this. Yeah, I think we'll find the data line is always high. And the clock is this. So depending how many times this rings before it dies down, will tell how many pulses we've got here. So that will determine how far along the register the data shifts and it will light the LEDs as it goes. So the longer this rings for, the longer this will shift in. Yeah, up to the maximum of eight times. The more oscillations, the better the coil, so the more LEDs light up. And I think that is how it's working. And I hope you guys either agree with me or you've learned a little bit there. Now let's reverse engineer it and figure out if that is actually correct. But it does help when you're doing this if you have some inclination of how it's likely to work before you start. The things you need to do this then. First of all, obviously, some magnification, unless your eyes are very good. So we can actually see the PCB. This is a double-sided, but in actual fact, it looks like there's only one track here and one track here. Basically, there don't seem to be any other tracks on this side of the board. If we look on the other side, we have most of the tracks, and we can sort of see the layout of this. So these are the LEDs, and these are all connected together on one side, and it goes to here, and it goes to here, and then down here, you can see the track. Let me find something to point to. Okay, so this is either going to be a power rail or it's going to be ground. And if we flick it over, we can see that it's ground. So you have ground here and you have ground here. That's the bottom one of these. And that is ground. So we know where the ground is on this. The power comes in here. It's marked VCC. There's no tracks here on this side of the board. So in fact, it's actually it's like it's going up there under this white logo. You can always use a test meter. We're going to have to use it in some points because it's a bit hard to see. Now, if I tilt it, we can probably see where they go. So we can see where the power comes in. So to start off reverse engineering it, I'm going to download the data sheets and print them out. When we've got the data sheets, what we'll do is we'll start from the ICs and work outwards. I think that's the way I prefer to do it. We'll get the ICs on the schematic first and then we'll kind of figure out where every pin of the IC goes to. And hopefully that'll pretty much give us the whole thing. So let's get some data sheets. We need LM393. That's the first one. This is the comparator. All data sheet will be fine and we can actually have a look at the pin out. So this is our chip. We can see two comparators with the inverted and non-inverted inputs, exactly as I described, power and ground and two outputs. So that's that one. So we can just draw that to be quite honest. It's quite simple. And then we need the other one, which is the CD4015 data sheet. Again, all data sheet. And this is a 4-bit static shift register. So it is a shift register. 4 bits, although there are 8 LEDs. So we'll have to see exactly how it's working. And you can see pretty much as I described it on here. 
we have a clock we have data we have reset for resetting everything we have another clock so there's two clocks on here and we would have to look through the data sheet to explain exactly how it works this gives us some idea so your data comes in here this is your clock which goes through to each of these shift registers this is your reset pin to clear all the data if you want to clear them and these are your outputs okay so whatever is on data just gets clocked in and there's two of them by the looks of it that probably explains why we have eight leds yeah we do so i'm thinking what's happening is this is data a clock a reset it a data b clock b reset b so when we've clocked the data in through the first four the output of this one will become the data for this one and clock into the next four that seems to be fairly obvious and i'll bet the clock pins and the reset pins are just connected to each other so we can print that one out and then we can start putting them onto our schematic we'll draw the ICs first and then we'll work from there really then the data sheets pretty much confirm what i thought about how this would operate it may be that when we were trying those transformers earlier because they're big toroidal mains transformers they may not ring very well the meant to be run at mains frequency not high frequency and this effect works better at higher frequencies so it may actually be that this tester cannot test those type of linear transformers and again we can find out we can have a play with some switch mode transformers once we've worked out how this actually works let's start then so this is our 4015 shift register and this is not the best pen in the world i need to buy some more but we have vdd vss this is power and ground power ground we have clock a and data a which i was just describing and reset a so these three pins affect this shift register and the data goes in position one two three four we also then have data for b which is this shift register we have clock for b and we have reset for b so these three pins control this side and the data shifts in one two three four so to start off with we can pretty much figure out where the leds are going to be connected on our schematic so let's put the leds in first now using our schematic to work out what goes where so let's put the leds on the schematic now using the pcb layout just to work out we can track them through and just figure out which one goes where from the data sheet we can figure out we should have the first lot of leds one two three four here on pins five four three and two of this four zero one five chip and because you light up from the red going across to green you'd expect this is one two three four so let's have a quick look to see if they go to where we expect them to so one end of the each led is connected together and we know this goes to ground we've seen that actually just look at the tracks so the other end if i'm right this one should go to pin five of this chip one two three four five and obviously i'm not right but it must go i'm guessing to one of the other ones or it may go through an L it may go through a resistor actually that makes sense there will be a resistor um we can see here there's lots of 1k resistors that's where they probably go into let's have a quick look just easily turn it over so in fact yeah we can see this led goes to a resistor here and the resistor here comes down to our chip we can see that that's the first one okay and we can actually see it goes to this pin so it's the fourth one from the top if i turn this over you just have to be quite careful when you do this flicking them over make sure you get the right pin but that is to in fact that was to there so the one we want is this one yeah fourth pin up from here one two three four so that pin goes to a resistor this resistor and the other end of this resistor will go to the first led 
Okay, so we can see that, and we can see it's a 1K resistor. And that 1K resistor we can see is coming from pin. Where I get to is pin 12. No, pin 13. 13, 14, 15, 16. So pin 13, that's out 1B. So this is out 1, yeah? And I think we can figure out now in order where they're going to go. So pin 12, because we need to sort of basically know what's going on with this, pin 12 will go to another resistor, that one. And the output from that resistor will go to this LED. Yeah, it makes sense. And so on. So we then have pin... 11 pin 10 so uh, 9 10 11 will go to another resistor and this will go to the next led so a pattern's forming already yeah and now we can continue to find all the rest of the leds so the last one on this side is on pin 10 so this is 9 pin 10 is here this is the last one this will go to yeah, this one. You can see where the 1K resistors are. 1, 2, 3, 4. And the output of this one, what well, goes off over there. Which LED does it go to? Well, it actually goes to the end one. So you've got a 1, 2, 3, and then a green one. Okay, that's not quite what I expected, but that's actually where it is going. Let's draw the one-hour diagram. And there we have the LEDs in the first four. So we can see where they're going. Resistors are 10, 11, 12, 13. I've counted the LEDs from this end as being the first red one being 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So they go to 1, 2, 3, and the last one goes to the green one at the end, which is 8. Now we've figured out that side, let's have a look at the other shift register on this side. So we can see we've got outputs on pins 5, 6, sorry, on pins 2, 3, 4, 5, and output 1 is on 5. So let's work this way across them. We're going to go to resistors and LEDs, let's just figure out which ones. So we'll start with pin 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's some 1K resistors here, so I'm guessing it goes to one of them. Yeah, that one. And out from here... One, two, three. That goes to LED five, which is one of the yellow ones. Next pin then is four. One, two, three, four. Probably goes to the next resistor, yeah. And the other end of the resistor, next LED, yeah. One of the greens. And then we have pin three, the next one, yeah. And then from here, another LED. The other green. And then the last one. goes to that one and the other end of that one will go to some other LED somewhere that yellow one okay so they're in a bit of a strange order but again we can draw them and we can label them up so I'll add those to our diagram and now we have the other LEDs on and we can see these are in a bit of a strange order so yellow LED 5 green LED 6 yellow LED 7 up four sorry i put an arrow here and this is green seven i probably written with some slightly strange positions but i can put some arrows so running through the shift register it looks like register b is where it starts and we go like led one two three and then eight uh, and then we have four five six seven so a strange order to me unless this works not quite in the way i thought or has he messed up the pcb who knows yeah but i'm sure we'll figure it out so we've got those so what we now want to look at is the other pins on here um let's have a look to see where the data and reset for a and b come from that'll be the next thing so six and seven on here a data and reset a and nine is the clock so these are the three we're now interested how does data get into the shift register a well we can look at the tracks we could just track it through but we have some tracks so let's have a look so 
this is pin seven which is on this side so it's the second one up so this is pin seven and we can see that actually goes down to a component underneath the shift register which looks like it's a resistor and it goes up here somewhere which i can't quite see behind the logo so let's see where it goes to i wouldn't be surprised if it goes to the other chip somewhere let's have a look. well it doesn't go anywhere here yeah it doesn't go anywhere here let's do it from the other side so this is data a and we know it goes to one of these resistors the thing is working yeah it goes to r14 is that one of the ones we use for the leds it certainly is so basically, the data come into A. Oh, I bet it comes from the last output on here. Yeah, makes sense. Is it pin 10? No. Okay, doesn't make that much sense. It comes from here. Pin 2. So the data into here is actually coming from the last output of this of the shift register. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, never mind. We can put that in, and it also goes to a resistor. Yeah, and that R14 is the same resistor that goes to pin 2. So data comes from pin 2 of the chip. Uh, does it go anywhere else? That's the resistor. With a large board, you can put a big piece of tin foil on and kind of like go across the tin foil. Let's just see if it goes anywhere else that we can spot. Looks like it doesn't. I mean, with the board this size, it's not difficult to do this. I just have to figure out where it goes. So, okay. So, data on pin 7 goes to pin 2. So, let's put that in. So, from here, you can do it how you like. If you want, the quick way is to put a dot where the wires join. And just go directly across where there's no connection or you can kind of like make it jump over it depends on what you want to do as long as you know what you mean it's fine so the data goes there so where's reset come from from here and where does clock come from well clock is on pin nine so that's over here so have a quick look underneath again that goes off up here somewhere again looks like it goes to a pin here and it looks like it goes up here somewhere. That goes to some other connections on the chip. Okay, so pin nine here. Where's that go to? I slipped there. I actually touched the same one. Doesn't go anywhere else on this side. Goes to pin one. Okay, that's the other clock. So clock A and clock B are connected to each other. And I'm guessing they go somewhere else. They go to a resistor here. Anywhere else? They go to our op amp on pin 1. Okay, so let's put the clock in. Let's figure out exactly where it's coming from. So it's definitely on pin 9 to pin 1. Okay. Let's draw that. Because I can't easily draw it on here. I'll just give it a name. So I'll usually say it like an arrow like that coming in. Yeah. And we'll call it CK. This is the best way to do this. You could draw the whole thing. But it's going to get messy. On here also, the same signal, CK. Okay, and then we can draw a different bit of the diagram to show where CK actually comes from. So let's see what it does. It goes to the LM339 on pin 1. So here's our LM339, and we can see pin 1 is the output from comparator A. 
So that's generating a clock signal. It's an output. It must be generating the signal. And we can call that signal. CK, which we can put inside the little label if we can fit it. So we know where the clock comes from now. We know where it goes to. We can very quickly check. Pin 1 goes to pin 1, goes to pin 9. But that clock signal goes somewhere else as well. So let's just see where it was. It goes to at least one resistor. Let's have a quick look around. So again, I'll just go around the board. We know it's on 9, so it doesn't go anywhere else. 9 and 1 doesn't go here doesn't go to any of this stuff okay nowhere near the transistor I'm sure it did go to a resistor somewhere and it goes to this one and it goes to here and it goes to here okay doesn't go anywhere else so it goes to two resistors we have uh, R9 which is a 4.7k and we have R2 which is a 1 meg so we can also put from here depends on where you want to draw it it's up to us really this is going to two resistors this is going somewhere R2, R9, R2 is a 1 meg resistor and R9 is a 4.7k. So I'll quickly see if we can figure out where they're going to. They might just go to a power rail. That's the first place we need to check. So we go to the other end of the resistor. Let's have a quick look. We go to ground or power. Yeah. Okay, so the 4.7 goes to power. Yeah. So that, that's easy so that that one there vcc or well, if you want to call it it calls it vcc here so it's vcc so that's power so where's the no sorry i've drawn it wrong that's r2 in fact you know to make my diagram look a bit better i'm actually going to say this is r9 this is r2 this is 4k7 and this is one meg. I probably should have figured out where they went before I drew them. Never mind. Where's the other end of the one meg? Is that go to ground? No, it doesn't go to ground. So that goes somewhere. Goes to another resistor 10k. Okay. Go to any of these little capacitors. Doesn't go anywhere down there. Okay, so it goes to another resistor 10k. That's the only place it goes to. So we have another resistor. I think it's the only place it goes to. We can have a quick look on the other side. This one is R1 10k. So why would you have a 1 meg and a 10k in series unless the junction goes somewhere? Let's have a quick look. It just sort of makes sense, yeah. I think the junction does go somewhere. I think it goes back to our chip, this one. Yeah, that goes back into our op amp on pin three. Okay, so we can see now this junction. Pin three. You see the logic of that? It, if there's a junction of two resistors, unless you've got some reason like you want to make a very high resistance on the high voltage circuit, and you might have several one meg resistors in series, but for something like a one meg and a 10k, we can pretty much certain that say that node, that junction goes somewhere. Okay, so that's that. Um, where's the end of the 10k resistor go? 
Well, I'm only going to do a side so you can see the two axles. Have a look. This one. Can we see where that goes? To go to the one above it. Yeah, it does. That goes to quite a few places. This might be power. No, it's not, but it goes to quite a few places. Well, we don't know where it goes at the moment. So what we'll do is, let's say that goes to A. We'll just call it A. Uh, it goes to A. And every time we find somewhere else that goes to A, we can draw that same symbol and then we'll know where it goes. Okay, so that's that one. Don't worry about it too much for now. Let's have another look around here. Since we're in this area of the circuit, so what else we've got? And it may be, by the way, that when you're doing this, you don't have to do the whole circuit. Okay. Pin two. Isn't connected to any other pins. Doesn't go to this chip. Probably goes into here somewhere. That goes to a 150k resistor. Okay. So I've got a 150k. And it goes to another one, a 33k. Is one of these resistors going to ground or power? Let's look at this one. Yeah, the 150k goes to ground. Okay. And then the other one doesn't go to power, it goes somewhere. Let's put them on. This is pin 2, stick it down here because we don't know how this is going to work out exactly, but we have a resistor going to power, VCC, so we have a resistor that goes to ground. That one being the one fifty K resistor. And we have another thirty three K which is going somewhere. This is R20. And this is R19. And again, that goes somewhere a bit unknown. We can have a quick look, see if we can figure out where it goes to. Otherwise, we'll put another node, B, and then we we'll, can work from there. So let's have a look. Ah, oh, okay. From the junction of these two, there's also a capacitor. This one, uh, on the other end of the capacitor, goes to the output, hot, okay, or is an input from hot, yeah, so coming from here, there's also a capacitor, and that comes in from hot. I'm guessing hot goes somewhere else as well. I think that's probably just an input from it to be monitored by this chip. We know it's got to compare. Oh, yeah, it looks like some sort of comparator here. So it's comparing the voltage on here with this network one way or another by the looks of it. Yeah, power. Some resistor. That's like a feedback resistor. Yeah, that sort of makes some sense. I'm thinking hot probably goes to the transistor as well. So I'm thinking that's going to be driving this. Doesn't actually. Goes down here. I 
that's the capacitor it goes to and it goes into here another capacitor okay another capacitor and the other capacitor goes to somewhere right around the circuit over here diode okay we have enough information here really about this part of the circuit without going through all the resistors and diodes and capacitors and tracing it all out because it's fairly obvious now that this op amp is being driven by a signal coming from hot this is where you put the coil under test so this will be that ringing effect i was describing this is obviously some sort of voltage divider point b i'm not sure exactly where it goes to it could be some sort of voltage reference and it's possible the transistor is involved in that or it's involved in driving the coil with pulse, a pulse to get it ringing yeah we'll find out shortly but we have a voltage divider here and we have an input from hot so this is where you get your ringing signal via a capacitor so that signal can increase or decrease the voltage here which is the inverted input of the op amp the non-inverted input goes to a, some sort of resistor divider i don't know exactly where this goes to i didn't trace it again but we have power vcc this is the output from the op amp we have another resistor which then comes to the inverting input and this resistor and this resistor seem to be involved in sort of voltage reference or voltage divider but to put a fixed voltage on here so basically every time this signal via the capacitor goes above this voltage the output will go to 12 volts and every time it goes below it will go to zero volts and we should get a signal on here as i thought with a sequence of pulses that counts how many times the thing oscillated the ringing as it died down so we can see that really and the clock from here clocks data into the shift register although i could go and figure out all the rest of the circuit i don't think it matters from the point of view of working out how this works and to see if it's functioning correctly what we need to do now really is figure out what drives the data signal if anything and what this op amp here is doing so if we have a look to see where this output goes that might give us some idea and again i'm expecting to find a similar type of network as we had here around these again between the inverting and non-inverting inputs i've just marked the inputs on so we know which is which let's see pin seven well it's under the ball can we see where it goes to it comes across here uh, I can see it sort of coming this way uh, and over here. Okay, let's have a look. Well, it goes to a 1K resistor here. It goes to the diode here, which is the cathode. Goes to another resistor here goes to another resistor here so it goes to several places let's see where the other end of this diode is going to so that is the cathode so if this is a positive supply it's feeding supply into here or feeding some sort of positive pulse into here i'll see if i can see it on the other side of the board that's this point can't easily see where that goes but it must go somewhere so let's have a look goes to another resistor here i'm trying to find something that goes to this transistor or back to here possibly although probably doesn't if it did it would be on the data b coming in but i don't think that's i think that's probably going to be held high Ah, okay goes back to the ic so this is pin 
6 comes to a resistor, other end of the resistor goes to a diode, other end of the diode goes to pin 7. So we have something like a resistor on here, go into a diode, which goes back to here, and I'm pretty sure the junction goes somewhere. And that's interesting, because that diode's kind of like reverse biased in my opinion. Pin 7. Definitely goes to the cathode. Where else does that go to? It goes to another resistor. I'll just double check this to make sure I haven't got it wrong. Yeah, 47k. Okay, so the resistor is 47k. That is R8. This is uh, D1. This, I'm sure, must go somewhere else. I couldn't obviously see where that goes to, although I think it probably does go somewhere else. So let's come in another way at this. Let's have a look at the transistor and see if, where this is in the circuit. First thing I look is to see what's happening with the collector base emitter. I think one might go to power. No, it doesn't, not that one. Okay, so the emitter is connecting to the power. This is a PMP transistor, so that sort of makes sense. So we have the emitter of the transistor pointing inwards, it's a PMP. This is the emitter, and this is going to VCC. So something's going to be switching this transistor, and it's going to be switching something. So let's have a look. So where's the collector go? Does this collector go to the... No, it doesn't go to the hot on there. All right, we'll figure that out in a minute. Where's it being switched from? So this is the base. So... Well, it goes here to a resistor, R5. Does that go to ground or VCC? Okay, so the base has a resistor going to R5, which is VCC, that's a, effectively a pull-up type resistor. So this is VCC here, this is power into the transistor. That is R5. And then there should be another resistor, I know it went to another resistor, which will be whatever is driving it. So, yeah, this one. So this is a 1K resistor here, which is R4. So we have another resistor here. 1K, R4. R5 was a 1K. Yeah, so we have something like that. Now something's driving this, so other end of R4, which is there, oh, that goes to the other end of this diode, which is pin 7 of our chip. So, pin 7 of our chip is also driving the transistor. Uh, so whatever's going on with these inputs, it's driving this. I wonder if this is some sort of oscillator. Let's see what that drives then. So that's base. So the important thing is now, where does the collector go? Then we can figure out what it's doing, I think. And I'm guessing it probably goes to hot. It probably drives the coil one way or another. So pin, so pin uh, this is the collector, okay? Where does that go to? Well, it looks like it's going somewhere... Obviously, it's going somewhere. Possibly to another resistor. Can't easily see from that side. Let's look from this side. So, collector, where are you going to? Maybe to a capacitor, possibly, that drives something, the output of this.
Well, it must go somewhere. Goes from the resistor here. So that's a 270 ohm resistor. That makes sense, that would be a lower value resistor because it's probably driving more current than the other ones. 270 ohm, which is R21. Uh, does that then drive the. No, it doesn't go to hot. Where does this end of it go to? So this is end from the collector there, this end here. Where does it go? Looks like it goes round here and then down the other side of the board, okay. So it goes to another resistor and another diode here. Uh, the diode is the anode, so that is driving to a diode. It's also going to a resistor. 1K, which is R23. This diode is um, D something, it's not marked, you can't really see it there. Where's the end of the 1K resistor go? Is this power or ground? Yeah, that's ground. So the output is obviously through this diode. Where does that go to? Well, it goes to a capacitor, which doesn't go to ground, so it goes to a capacitor. Put the capacitor here, because I'm not sure how it's going to work out. Uh, is that the end of the capacitor? No, that's the diode. Oh, hold on. All the end of the diode goes to ground. Okay. So from here, just double check. 270 ohm. Collector. All the end of the diode goes to ground. Yeah, the diode and resistor are basically parallel, going to ground. So where's this capacitor going? Well, that's ground, so that might not be doing anything. This is just ground, so can't be driving any sort of signal. So what does this transistor actually do? It must drive something. It's not just feeding into this resistor, it's going somewhere. Right, guys, we have enough. We don't need to track any more of this out because we have enough to see exactly how it works. I can see how it works. I hope you guys can, actually. So... What we have here, this transistor is feeding current via the 270 ohms via a capacitor into the coil we're testing, the one we want to ring. And it basically sends a pulse. So this must be an oscillator. I wouldn't say it's continually oscillating. It probably, well it is, but it's sending a pulse every so often. So I think we just get a pulse and then a gap and then another pulse. And then a gap, I'm not sure how long it takes. We can put the oscilloscope on and have a look. So this pulse starts the coil ringing. Not only does it do that, but via the little 100 picofarad capacitor, it generates the reset. So it hits a reset on here, and it turns all the LEDs off when it extends the pulse. So the thing starts ringing, okay? This must be an oscillator of some sort. When the coil is ringing, that's being monitored by this op-amp on the non-inverting input. Sorry, on the inverting input. So we have some sort of voltage divider. I described it before. We get the oscillations here. Every time it goes higher than whatever this reference is, we get a 12 volts. Every time it goes lower, we get a zero. So we get a number of pulses, 12 volts high, each one represents one oscillation. This is dying down, these stay the same. Those pulses go into the clock. Okay, 
So that's clocking the shift registers. Clock, 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 clock. That then starts shifting data in. The data in here is held high via this pull resistor 4.7k which goes to vcc i had it wrong going to there so that's what that is so the leds light up in sequence now the sequence is a bit strange i'm not sure if that's i didn't really exactly understand the nature of the shift register maybe that's why they're in a strange order but we could find out we could easily test it by basically not putting a coil on here but putting some sort of pulse in here that we can pulse ourselves manually and every time we do it we should get one led lighting up in sequence that'll prove it's working yeah so that's what that's doing so one oscillator one comparator driving the clock of the shift register and clocking data and then lighting leds that's what i thought it was and that's what it is so we can test it i'll switch it on i have the coil attached to the uh, output from the tester i have my power supply set to 12 volts this is a transformer from a switch mode power supply just a scrap atx this bit of wire which is just wrapped around but not connected is to simulate a fault a shorted turn so let's see what happens when we switch this on. Well, we have... Ah, yeah, there we go. So we have all the LEDs are lit up. Okay, so that is a good transformer, no doubt. I'm pretty sure it was. So they are lit up. Let's have a quick look on the scope. So, yeah, this is a bit unstable, but this is basically the output. So when we stop it... Yeah, so effectively, you can see like a, a ringing waveform there, yeah, as it effectively pings the coil and it's counting these oscillations, thus it's lighting all the LEDs. Let's now try to put a fault on this. So what I'll do is I'll actually connect together my bit of wire. So this is simulating a short circuit turn. I've just wrapped the wire once around the former okay let's see what it does now well just one led lights up the red one so that's definitely stopping it from working basically at one shorted turn as you can see stops it ah, all back on again so that definitely works, guys. And you can see clearly what a shorted turn does to a transformer. This is quite a, a simple little thing, really. I mean, the CMOS chip was a matter of pence. I'm using the LM358. Seems to be working quite happy with that. I noticed when I first switched it on that one of the LEDs was actually back to front hence the fact I had to resolve it but now you can see it's working fine this one wasn't lighting up just because I had it in the wrong way around that is a success guys without a doubt I'm sure now you know basically what a ring tester is what it does You've seen a simulated fault of a short circuit turn in the transformer, so you can see what actually happens. It does stop the transformer from working, as you can quite clearly see. And this is a very cheap device to build. The way I did it this way round would be very easy just to make some holes for the LEDs, put it into the case. There's four mounting post there which was kind of like inset from the leds so you would just see the leds on off switch uh, some connections for the device under the test a little uh, 12 volt power supply inside the case and that's it you've got everything you need okay not only do we understand now what the ring tester does but with a little bit of reverse engineering we can understand how this actually works i hope you've also seen that when you were maybe just want to repair something you don't have to reverse engineer the entire circuit you just have to figure out what the bits are doing which is what i did there and then that's enough to probe around if you need to if something isn't working fortunately in this case it did actually work so was that a waste of time reversing it no i think we learned quite a bit okay guys just need to say then to you thank you for watching hope you enjoyed it 
I'd like to say to PCBWay once again, thank you very much for sponsoring the channel and for giving me the opportunity to build a lot of these projects. And I'm quite happy that some of you guys would want to actually build this project you can get the pcbs uh, five of them from pcb way for five dollars plus postage and that's all you need build one for yourself and maybe sell a few to make up uh, just enough money to cover your cost yeah okay i'll see you all soon on another learning electronics repair video and i'd just like to say ciao for now